Welcome back to Did You Know CIUS Answers. With us today is Miroslav Shklandri, Professor Emeritus of the University of Manitoba and a former head of the Department of German and Slavic Studies. He researches aspects of modern Ukrainian and Russian culture history, including the avant-garde Soviet literary politics, nationalism, imperialism, and contemporary debates around decolonization. His latest publication is titled In the Maelstrom, the Waffen-SS Galicia Division and its Legacy. The book is the first comprehensive study of the division to address both its wartime experience and its post-war fate. In the Maelstrom draws on the archival research that includes interrogation records, interviews, memoirs, testimonies, and creative literature. Miroslav Shklandri discusses the commissions of inquiry into war crimes during the 1980s, recent debates over the issue of monuments and commemoration, and different ways in which veterans, the diaspora community, Western governments and researchers have approached the division and its history. Welcome, Dr. Sklendli. Thank you for inviting me. Recent events have placed the subject matter of your book on the front pages of news publications around the world. There is much disinformation circulating around a very complex time in history. Can you explain for our audience, what was the SS Galicia division? Okay, I will try. It was created in or announced, the creation was announced in April 1943. And uh, it was uh, a way for Germany, which was beginning to lose the war, to draw Ukrainians into a, uh, a military unit. The Ukrainians wanted an army. They were, uh, they also knew that the Germans were losing. And they hoped at the end of the war, in the chaos of the war, to be able to have a modern army, a well-trained army with their own officers, uh, which they could actually turn, that army they could turn uh, into uh, an army struggling for independence. Their orientation was 1918, because that, in that year, uh, as the Austrian em Austro-Hungarian Empire fell apart, the Siege Riflemen, the Siege of Istrici, which had been trained by Austria, did become the nucleus of the Ukrainian army and fought for independence. So the hope was, in the minds of these young people who were recruited, that something similar would happen. There was a special clause, there was several special clauses or special arrangements made with the, made with the Germans. The um, division uh, was only to fight on the Eastern Front against the Red Army. They would have chaplains, which was uh, which was almost unique uh, in the Waffen SS. And that was so that uh, the chaplains could uh, negate any uh, Nazi propaganda, or mitigate it at least. Um, it had to be mechanized. And the army had to have Ukrainian officers because the idea was that a cadre of young officers would, would be trained. Uh, and, and then there would be an army that could fight uh, for Ukraine. Now, whether that ever was a possibility, a realistic possibility, can be debated. That, however, is how they sold to the recruits how the... Uh, the recruitment board, the Ukrainians, privately, out of German earshot, sold it to soldiers. And that's essentially why they uh, they joined. Can you tell me um, what other SS divisions existed at that time? Yes, there were almost 40. Um, and uh, the, the first divisions were actually SS. They were only for Germans, and they were named SS. Then as the manpower began to dry up, the Germans began to recruit Germanics, meaning people of Germanic origin, non-Germans, but Scandinavians, Dutch, and so on. And uh, their designation was slightly different. Uh, they were designated as SS Freiwilligen, SS volunteers. 
Then in 543, the need for manpower is so great that they create, they began drawing in Slavs. Slavs, after all, as you know, were classified as subhuman. They were to be uh, essentially uh, exterminated or made into slaves. But with the with the need for for troops, they they created a third designation, and it, and the wording there was der s der uh, uh, so of the uh, Raffinesses, and that signified non-Germans, non-Germanic Slavs. So that's that's essentially. Uh, Towards the end of the war, how the Ukrainians uh, got uh, got a division. Now there have been allegations of the Galicia division of committing war crimes. Uh, what can you tell us about the evidence of such accusations, and how have Western governments addressed this? Well, there have been many inquiries. They began first. The Poles looked into allegations uh, immediately at the end of the war. The, uh, the Soviet uh, repatriation commissions were also interested in uh, what happened during to these men, what they did, uh, investigated them. But the big commissions occurred in the 1980s. That's the Duchenne Commission in Canada, the uh, Hetherington Chalmers Commission in the UK, and the Menzies Inquiry in Australia. They all looked into not just the division, but war crimes in general. None of them singled out the the division as uh, guilty of uh, war crimes per se. Um, they 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 were looking for any individual who could be and should be further looked into, whose past should be further looked into, and there were a few that they that they identified, but not uh, division members. However, it's very important to note that. Um, the recruits to the division came in three cohorts. There was the patriotic youth that signed up immediately after the uh, announcement of the division's creation. And they were very often people with completed high school education, uh, you know, people that really uh, wanted to become part of the Ukrainian army. When that first cohort was destroyed almost completely, uh, at the Battle of Brode, out of 10,000 people that went in, 3,000 came out. They began, uh, the Germans began uh, to uh, conscript. And very many of those people had no choice at all. They were put to the wall uh, with a gun to their heads, and they were told, either you join the division or we shoot you. And, and they demonstrated that they would shoot them. And so quite a few joined uh, under duress. There were also uh, people from other units, not necessarily uh, units in training, uh, police battalions, uh, various uh, people in, in different German uniforms who were folded into the division. That's where some of the criminality uh, can be found and has been found. Um, and then at the very end of the war, um, there was uh, a third group of people who were essentially trying to escape to the West and the, often with a murky past. So they, they came to the division right at the end. But the crimes, I, I looked into as, as many of the accusations as possible. And I, I mean, they don't, they don't pan out when you look at the division per se, the division as such. But there is this caveat. Um, of the 20,000 men that were uh, the Germans took to, into arms, only about 14,000 were sent to the division for training and to the reserved, reserve force for the division. About five 6,000 were siphoned off into so-called regiments uh and these these were uh, this was a clever way for the germans to avoid uh saying that they were creating police regiments because the agreement with the ukrainians had been this would be a frontline regiment 
it would fight on the front line against the Red Army. The Germans, however, wanted to make use of this excess manpower, and they wanted to use it for police work. So they created four regiments, about a little over a thousand in each one. And the fourth and fifth regiments uh, were active in the Ternopil area, in Viv area, and in the border between what is today uh, Poland and Ukraine. And the accusations, uh, some of them uh, sh shown to be correct, were that um, they they pacified, so so called pacified various villages, and they did commit uh, some more crimes. The big issue, the big uh, notorious one, is Huta Penyatska, where some say five hundred people, some say more, up to a thousand were killed. Huta Penyatska was a stronghold of the Polish and the uh, pro-Soviet or Soviet underground. When it was put down, the divisions, the, the regiment, the fourth regiment was there. And um, it has been accused of also uh, participating in the massacre of civilians that, that occurred afterwards. Now, this is, I'll tell you why this is so important. Because uh, the names of these regiments were the volunteer, the Galicia Volunteer Regiment. So they, the Germans cleverly fudged, fudged it to make it look like these people were in some sort of uh, uh, training or preparation for joining the division. They also got the division badge with the lion and the three stars. So you can see why uh, civilians who, who saw these people thought this was the division and reported these, this was the Ukrainian division. After all, they, they had the, the lion insignia and they were called, they had the word Galicia in, in their name, but they were not under command or control of uh, the, the division. And uh, there were repeated uh, attempts to uh, stop them from uh, doing this police work, to draw them out of it. Um, um, they, these, these regiments eventually were, were almost destroyed in battles um, and, uh, and had to retreat. So that's a long answer to, to your question. Yeah, no. What happened to the men at the end of the war then? Well, uh, the the majority were uh, surrendered to the British. They retreated and were interned first in Italy, in Rimini, and then for two years, and then two years in the UK. Uh, a smaller group, about 1,500 were, a bit less than 1,500 were uh, interned by the Americans and released after about a year. There were long discussions in Britain as what to do with these men. Eventually they were civilianized, uh, given civilian status, um, looked at again, and the, it was decided that they, they, they couldn't find any criminality among the men. And like all the other prisoners, whether Waffen-SS uh, people or uh, Wehrmacht, Wehrmacht people, they were released uh, 49.50. Now, some of these men had really interesting um, later careers. Uh, one group, for example, were, which was in training, uh, deserted um, from, the, from their German uh, taskmasters and joined the French resistance and became... Uh, decorated members of the French resistance. So, you know, they became heroes in, in one sphere and they were considered villains uh, in a different sphere. Some of them uh, joined the French Foreign Legion. Uh, some became UN peacekeepers. Some joined the US Army and had careers there. Uh, one group at the end of the war was recruited by the UK and parachuted into the Soviet Union uh, to make contact with the underground, 
they were picked up and shot because Kim Philby was the liaison person uh, and uh, let the Soviets know that these people were coming in. So many of them had uh, interesting careers. A lot of a lot of the people, a lot of the people who came to the United States, United States or Canada had careers, um, you know, very good careers and uh, as engineers and uh, doctors and even scholars uh, taught at universities uh, made were prominent in the Ukrainian community. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Skandri. You've highlighted the true complexity of this issue and we all need to stay informed as the conversation continues. Thank you and uh, I'm looking forward to reading your book. Thank you.